Hey guys, back on the podcast, sitting here with the fantastic Matt Capitelli. Hey, what's going on? How are you? Man, better than ever. Can I call you fantastic? Why not? I don't know. I usually come on this thing and have like awful adjectives for people. What's your adjectives? Adjectives for myself? Yeah. <sighs> Trivial. <laughs> because you're of trivia questions? Of trivia questions. I sometimes don't know what's going on. I have less brain than I used to. So well, that's, well we can't trivial. dive right into all of this. Well, yeah, that's all right. Did they know that you were Cal Mum's performer of the year? Who? That's the trivia question. Ah, could be. Cal, I hadn't thought of that. What one was yet. Cal Mum again? <laughs> Cal Mum, Caledonia Mumford. Caledonia Mum. So for the so Matt and I go like ten years back. No. Yeah, it'll be more than that. Thirty two. So we were eighteen when we met. Mm-hmm. Yeah, eighteen years old, like little kids. Kalamazoo, man. Yeah. Football players. Now you. So I. We met at. So Matt won tough enough two. Three. Three. Who's two? Oh, the girls were two. Uh, I don't even remember. God, I can't wait to talk to you about the guy with the mohawk. Jake? <laughs> Jake. Is that, I know. That, was, that was a different season. Was it really? Yeah, yeah. And then he went on to play slam ball? But we'll still talk about him. <laughs> Who was the winner with you? John Hennigan. Oh, yeah. Morrison. Oh, that's yeah. right. Slam ball guy? Oh, slam ball guy got screwed. That's right. Yeah. I always get him mixed up. I thought you got screwed. But you won. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then slam ball guy. I refer to him as Slam Ball because do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. He was like Jake. six eight. He used to jump fences and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And then he I was like, he should have won when the girls won. Or that's what they said. Right. And then the reality biz. Yeah. I don't know about this. Yeah. <laughs> and then like I, and then Slam Ball was on uh TNT. Do you remember Slam Ball? I remember Slam Ball, of course. That was with the trampolines, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then I saw him on there. And I was like, that's the tough enough guy. Yeah. Slam ball. So, tough enough guy. Is that a, is that a stigma? Tough enough? Tough, you're tough enough guy? I think absolutely. Dude, like, it's been a stigma, but, you know, what are you going to do about it? I, well, I think Nitro is... Nitro? <laughs> <laughs> What's John, his name now? Morrison? Now Hennigan? Johnny Blaze. Yeah, he had a lot of names. A lot of names. Uh, all right, well, let's, uh, let's get some, some football talk out of the way. Yeah. Uh, Matt was like my only friend on the football team, I would say. I'm saying this to you, mm-hmm. Western Michigan. I I had an off, and I've talked to you a little bit about this. I had an awful experience uh, at Western, and um, what I remember here's my memory with you right. is uh, we were in the computer room for some reason, and um, I was like looking up like dirt sheets. Do you remember this? I think I do. On the computer, I think I do. And just like so, like that's what everyone was probably like on ESPN.com, and I was on like. <laughs> No DQ dot net or yeah. something, <laughs> and uh, we started talking a little wrestling, and uh, and I, I think we struck up a little friendship. And um, were you? But you were you? You were into wrestling then a little bit, but I mean, I, did did you? You didn't? Did you know it was going to take over your life? I don't know. No, not absolutely not. When I came in, it was you know it was football hundred percent, and I was a wrestling fan going way back. But then when meeting you, it was like man, it got me back into it kind of you know what i mean because i had stepped away to focus so much on football and i was like all right man i think i can bond with this dude a little bit (laughs) but you had a good you had a good football experience kind of no yes Uh, yeah i did but you stopped you got stopped short yeah i ended up having knee surgery and uh you know it was just kind of the end of the end of the road wasn't gonna happen uh you were known for the bad knees right yeah i had knee problems since i was a kid so let's let's hear these things here are these things. Yeah, what do we got? We got, well, we had uh, patella, patella shaped real weird from birth. So the harder I worked, the basically the more pain I was in. They had to correct it. I just had to fight through it, and I had to do four different surgeries to, to correct it. At what age? First two were 17, no, 16, and then the last two were, gosh, I was probably 18 or 19. No, I was probably 19. Well, what age did they tell you your knees were, were screwed up? Just somehow I developed when I was born. So they like when you were a kid and you were like, "Mom, Dad, my knees hurt." When you were playing soccer, and then they took you to the doctor, and they and they found this out. No, it was never it never showed itself until uh, right before my junior year in high school, training for football and everything, and it was just started getting real bad, and they started really noticing. And I think that was probably the time when I started putting on the most muscle. Just you know, I was at that age, and I really started noticing at that point something was not right. But, you know, I fought through it, and then I started going to the other knee, and it was like, man, there's no way I'm going to be able to play at the next level like this. 
And you were like Johnny Athlete, yeah? Yeah, I was I was pretty much all around athlete at the school, yeah. Yeah, and when we got to uh <laughs> well, what did you play? Football? Did you play any other things? Football, track, basketball, whatever. And when we got to when we were 18 and I was still this pudgy little Jewish kid trying to play college football, you were like Jack Diesel. Yeah. Uh just work out. You were the workout guy. What was um hold on, I'm trying to think. And your dad owned the gym. Yeah. Um, oh, it was called something funny. I forget. Uh, pump house. The pump man. house. Yeah, right. man. <laughs> yeah, man. I I just shaped my life, man. I grew up, and from day one, as far back as I can remember, I lived in my dad's gym. You know, from the time I woke up in the morning to the time my dad took me home at night, I was living in the gym. So I learned at a really young age just about fitness and what was going on. It was probably my first passion. D- do you remember? Like the gym, did the gym people take you on as like a young son? Did you oh, have like yeah. gym uncles oh, totally, that didn't dude. touch you? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. <laughs> totally, man. I had gym uncles all over the place, Ooh. and everybody got to know me. And it was like you know, everybody would come in and try to get me to work out with them. You know, they get these little kid behind the desk, you know, looking up to my pops, and you know, some dude would walk in and be like, "Let's get Matt out here and start seeing what he can do." And they'd put me through some little workouts and stuff, just you know, for their own amusement. But, right, you know, at like ten years old or whatever. Nah, uh, probably like six or seven. Oh wow, just messing around with me. And then all of a sudden, you get to the age where you start probably out benching these guys. <laughs> well, it was like eleven when my dad. I never played pee wee football because my dad didn't want me to till I had strength train, you know, with weights and everything. So it took until I was about eleven years old when he started teaching me to really how to train and everything i trained hard and then you know then i got real big gains real quick yeah um where you're from calmon which is where caledonia is it's like a Sorry. suburb real rural suburb of rochester rochester yeah and uh it's you and you have you have sisters or brothers i got one younger brother oh that's right i do remember that and he's like taller than you right oh dude he's huge yeah yeah he got all the size he's like six one i think he's like two pushing 250 right now jesus what's he doing he's huge life? just getting big <laughs> He's a teacher. He's a teacher? Yeah. Did he play college ball? He did. He played at uh, D3 school in Rochester. Yeah. Did really well. Do you, because you were in in New York area, and you went and played in Michigan, and not a full scholarship, right? No, I was a walk-on. Right. Um, sometimes, so my plan was to play college football, and I've said this before, because I just wanted Jim Ross to see it on my resume, and I wanted one year so I could then go to the WWF. Um, and... If I was to actually have a good college football career, I would have totally went to a D3 school because I think I was – I mean, obviously, I was the worst player on the team, so uh, <laughs> I was there. All right, Me and one of the – I think, like, the white kicker. The white kicker. He was pretty good. Actually, though. it was yeah. Solent. I remember that for some reason. I think he was faster than Yes. You <laughs> he, he did. Yeah. The kicker ran a faster 40 than I, I did. I think he tripped you once, too. <laughs> um, but if I, was to, if I wanted football, I think I would have went to a D3 school to have been successful is that something that's ever crossed your mind like do you have football regrets or thoughts no i don't have any regrets but it was at the point where you know we came from a real good high school football team you know state champions and we were really well and it was kind of the point where i was like i'm either going to be a big fish in a little pond or i'm going to be a little fish in a big pond you know going stepping up but my dream was always you know Wrestling, D1 football, NFL, you know the whole deal when you're a kid. The bigger than, right. larger than life right. kind of thing. Okay. So it was like, I'm going to give a shot. I'm going to walk on to a Division One program and just see what I can do. So, you know, and I don't have any regrets from that. I think if I would have played D3, you know, probably would have been more successful. But I think I would have looked back and said, what more could I have done? Mm-hmm. And it's funny um, because I always say, and, and I have this, that football didn't work out for me. And... uh and I always say, like, not that – and you're a big religious guy, and but I, I am not so much. But I, I do believe, like, that that was – almost that there was a path. Like, had – thankfully, football didn't work out for me, and I saw how much I hated the first year, maybe because I went to that Division One school instead of Division Three. So because I hated it so much, I was able then to go to wrestling, to start my wrestling career earlier, and then really get into what's been, you know, obviously my passion and what I love. And so – it almost allowed me to get on the correct path by going to this school, and uh, so you, I mean, your path obviously you stopped your knees. You, you were your knees got fucked up. You had the surgeries. You started working as like kind of a a helper on the team, right? Yeah, I was well when I was at Western. Uh, I was a um, exercise science major, and that was what I wanted. You know, career wise, aside from wrestling football, I wanted to be in strength and conditioning. So 
when I did get hurt and I knew it was going to be done playing football, uh, the head coach, remember Darnell? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Darnell pulled me aside and said, hey, you know, uh, we want to put you with Vezo, who's a strength coach. And he said, you know, would you be interested in doing that? And I was like, yeah, man, something to keep me around. Even though I can't play, I can still be involved. And that was kind of the transition. But then that also path led you to uh, to the tough enough thing, right? Yeah, man. It's weird how stuff like that happens because if it wasn't for that break in me playing football and actually rehabbing and getting the surgeries done, I wouldn't have the time or the physical ability to actually try out. Yeah, and and you wouldn't have been able to do it if you were playing football. No. Yeah. No. And so I, I mean, I was at at home. What year was it tough enough? Was it O two for you? No, I think it was two thousand, man. Well, I, I feel like, like but I wouldn't have been on campus because if I was on campus when you were on camp, like if I, I don't think I was in Kalamazoo. I think I was back in Chicago. You probably a better judge of time. Yeah, than I, I, I think maybe oh one. I, that's when I graduated. I don't know. It was some, but I just remember being like, "How could this guy not win?" That's my thoughts, like of you, because I know you so well. And I know your passion for uh, just for. I, I knew you weren't like I. In rea- I didn't. I didn't know much, but in reality TV, they, they always choose these assholes, these these guys that right, you yeah. know they're screw ups and drunks. Everyone wants to party, and I just knew your passion and your love. And like I knew there was no quit in you, and um, and so you. I mean, to me, it was like obvious that you won. Uh, I mean, when you won, that you would win. I don't know, <laughs> but I, <laughs> did you have that feeling or was- well, going in, but, you know. My whole mindset going into anything is is nothing's going to stop me type deal. You know what I mean? If it's going to, it's going to have to take me out completely. And it was something where I wasn't going to quit. wasn't going to be one of the ones on the show that quits, that falls out, that gets sidetracked by the drugs, drinking, partying. You know, because that was never me. I was there for a purpose, you know what I mean? And it was like that's what my focus was. I knew I wasn't going to be outworked. Because from day one through up and through football and whatever it was athletically, uh, you know what I mean? Mo- emotionally, it was like I'm I'm fixated on something, and, and I'm not going to be broken like that. Let's see, uh, these guys in this house. Who was besides uh, Morrison? Was there anybody else that we still know? No, I don't Ronnie know, was he one of the guys? Ronnie could have been <laughs> Jonah. No, Jonah. Jonah was there. He- but- I'm rem- I'm starting to remember. I watched them all, Man. but they all mix up to me. Yeah, Jonah was there. He he went through some tough legal stuff a few years back. Oh, really? Yeah, he got. Got in trouble with some drug trafficking. He was underground wrestling. I th- yeah, I think so. <laughs> in Mexico and Tijuana. Yeah, he's trying to go under a under a mask. Yeah, so I'm a wrestler, <laughs> sir. It's like you have ten bags of cocaine on you. <laughs> uh, uh, so I was that house nuts. It was nuts, man. Yeah. It was you know it was different. It, you get all these personalities together. It's just like you know you look in any locker room you're in. You got different personalities. You know everybody's there for a purpose, but this is different because. All of us, except John, were, were new to wrestling. You know what I mean? Had he been Green wrestling? Can be. He had been training at, uh, I think it was XPW for a little while. <laughs> I don't know if this he, place to train. He, he, <laughs> Light bulb tubes. He, <laughs> he came in, and he, you know, we would we would be sitting around, and he, he'd do these uh, flippy doos off the ropes and stuff. And we're like, what are you doing, man? He goes, oh, yeah, I've been working on these. <laughs> That's just how he was. Right. You know? Supreme, the, uh, Supreme has been teaching me, who's a, a known <laughs> deathmatch fighter yeah. in XPW. <laughs> Uh, wow! So he did have the one up. He did. I mean, he, he much, trained a much bit. like um, Chris Harvard. Chris Harvard. He was in. That wasn't your season, though. That nah, I know was, that was one. Was he had the one up. He had, remember he had been training at Kowalski's for yeah, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. But John, I mean, regardless if he had trained before or not, was just phenomenal athlete. Like his gymnastic background. I mean, guy can do anything. Yeah. Did you? Did you see where the producers, I don't know, and this, again, this is a long time ago for you, were they trying to produce these shows? You know, I talked to M-Dog a little bit, who was on the newer one, and, you know, he could see how they were swaying it this way or that. And back then, it wasn't really known. Now it's kind of known. It's kind of funny. It's kind of almost like wrestling reality TV is where it's it's kind of known. It's a little bit fixed, but you watch it because it's fun. Right. But back then, reality TV was almost pretty new genre. Uh where people didn't know that they're the producers were in on it and trying to sway storylines and whatnot. Yeah, they definitely try to get their influence pushed over if they saw something they wanted to go with. It was uh, so I don't want to, uh, and you don't talk about whatever you don't want to. But like the was it Demond or Bob Holly, right? What the guy that beat me? Yeah, yeah, it was Bob Holly. Was that so? As my like knowing you, uh-huh. I was just like Matt's so awesome. 
he, there's no dirt on this guy. He's like the he's the man. He's the best. And I could see producers being like, well, we got to get something, and like almost pushing him. Like th- I see that being a, a reality show TV produced segment almost. Not what happened, yeah. but trying to make it happen. Well, man, and, and to this day. You know, and I've, I've kind of just let it go because, you know, you're never going to get a straight answer from the, the people that know. You know what I mean? But from the time and the way that was set up, it's it almost had to be contrived some way, shape, or form. You know what I mean? And whatever the the reason was behind it doesn't really matter to me. But it, it wasn't something that I think just happened. Do you – I still hold a grudge on defensive football coach, Coach uh, Knowles. Do you do you hold the same grudge, <laughs> Bob Valley? I'm not letting that one go, Caps. Man, I remember when Knowles threw that right hook. Oh, yeah. he yelled at me because I didn't have a pencil. Was a Division One school, and they have everything for us. I was dressed in like Nike outfits to the T, and I'm like, well, I assume they'll have a pencil for me in this notebook, and they didn't. And then like that was day oh, one. Oh man, so it's all downhill after it's, that. It, he's the the worst. Yeah. I mean, is, so can you understand my hatred for people? I, I, I can know. understand, man. The the thing about the whole Holly situation, it was like, you know, I, I don't know what the guy's reasons for, whether it was prompted or he was just an angry human being at the time and maybe still is. I don't know. But the whole fact is I'm not going to – I don't hold grudges yeah. really because I think, man, it's it's it, that's only going to keep me in the past. I'm not about living there and, and about moving on. I got other things to deal with. I mean, I'm with you. But fucking Knowles, the worst. <laughs> ah, man. Can I, I can I hear your Tough Enough tryout promo? Do you remember Tough it? Tough Enough tryout? I don't even remember, If I had man. video camera it, on It you? wasn't even a promo, man. What was it? It was more me, me, more or less, just talking out of my head about anything. Come on. Everything. So you see the commercial, or you see it on the internet, and you grab your buddy, and you're just like, well, I'm going to make this. Or did somebody push you to do it? No, I, I actually sent in, because at the time I, was, I had my surgery of the Tough Enough 2. I sent in my audition video uh, a week late. So they scrapped it, and I missed it. And I was like, ah, shoot. So I was like, if, this, if they do another season, I'm going to you know, be ready for it. And I, I happened to catch the audition somewhere online or something. And I said, oh, i got to send in. It's, the deadline's a week away or something. I had to overnight a video. So I grabbed my roommate. Went to the Western Michigan locker room, football locker room, grabbed a video camera and said, just shoot, man. And we just did one take of a two-minute video of me just – I don't even remember what I said, what I did. I I know I did some, like, agility stuff just to show I was an athlete. I think I cut a promo on Jericho, something like that, and uh, just sent it in. Over had overnight it. To Hoping get it that match would happen. <laughs> Hoping that or something would happen. They, you would bypass Tough Enough yeah, and go right to you and Jericho. Something. Had to be relevant some way. Um, Okay, so you you win the thing. They send you to developmental, right? Is that I mean, are you ready to move to Louisville, Kentucky, and change your life? Or yeah, I'm ready, man. It was <laughs> it was the kind of thing where we sat home. I sat home in New York for man a couple months while the show actually aired because they were going to bring us all back for the live finale. So for a couple months, we just had to sit still with your mouth shut, and not really say what was going on. And then at that point, it was uh, the night I won. Didn't know what was going to happen at that point but then they called and said you're flying tomorrow to raw you know that monday and that's the, the monday that we were on for the first time and i don't even remember yeah, did you had... do a backflip in the ring or something no or? i tried but i <laughs> spiked myself <laughs> no we just we went out and did like an they called it an exhibition match just in case we screwed up they didn't want to say it was a real match did you have a match yeah with who with john it was really me, me versus john was, what'd you uh, wear I don't even remember. Just some sh- random shorts I had in my bag. <laughs> we didn't have any gear. We just looked completely homeless. Imagine out there. you you have homeless, but like John's been training at XPW for like two days, so he's got like <laughs> he all had, this XPW lucha stuff. He on. had like kick pads, yeah. and the whole deal, man. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> he's got this amazing entrance, and like, he's yeah. like, oh, you didn't get ready, and you just look like this schmuck and, yeah. and a white beater. Basically, yeah. that's my vision of it. <laughs> that's pretty accurate. So, how did the exhibition badge go? It was good, man. It went, it went smooth. Were you, you know. scared? I was nervous. The people? Yeah. It, yeah. Was in, it was in Chicago, man. So it was a big place. So I didn't was, see you. Yeah. I was probably bitter that I wasn't <laughs> <laughs> that I wasn't booked as an extra town. That I wasn't listening to Eugene that night. Right. I was probably a little upset. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and so so you did go to developmental, though? And, I, I mean... 
Yeah, yeah, to answer your question three questions ago that no. I forgot already. Yeah. Yeah. We uh after that we uh got sent I think we had a week, nah, maybe two weeks or so to get everything packed up and they gave us to move down to I think it was April. We had to be down there like the first week in April or something like that. So And there's guys that have been training their whole life, trying to be wrestlers, get this big deal. Um they're down there and then in come um you and John. Uh I as a wrestler myself, it's really I mean it really is on attitude and nice it's just as a person but there's that thing in wrestling you know who's this guy walking in who yeah. does he think he of is of course man uh see you're you're all right because you're just such a sweetheart that <laughs> you know like but there i'm sure there was people that were a little salty oh man there's probably still people salty. There's still people salty. <laughs> well, you're looking at me like but, that right now <laughs> i'm just kidding. no come on no now. i'm just kidding man um when we went down there I, th- I remember the first time we walked in, we didn't know where to go, what to do, and John and I, you know, got an uh, apartment together. So we were like, "All right, man, oh, that's cute." Just, yeah, it was kind of cute, <laughs> tough enough apartment. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we walk in. And, Do you have lockers? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're right next to each other. Who was it? Was uh, what's the big? Was big coming in and checking on no, you, no, tucking no. you in, <laughs> <laughs> tucking me in, fluffing my pillow. Right. Yeah, yeah. Now we walked in, man. I, I know our, our first practice. You know, of course, you know, Rip Rogers is there. Stops everything. Oh, you know, and he's yeah. one of those guys. Oh, yeah, man. Oh. Just totally made a scene, and we were like, wow, what an entrance on the first day, man. Not knowing what to think, and this guy just tore us apart, basically. He goes, I think the first thing he said to me, he goes, he goes, aren't you aren't you the one that got your butt whooped by Bob Holly? And I was like, yeah, that's me. He goes, all right, get in the ring. <laughs> get in the ring. And I think I took every single OVW wrestler's finisher at that time. They're finishers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which all happened to be a Stone Cold Stunner. No, hey. it actually happened to be a couple power bombs and choke slams, which, you know, of course I've never taken anything like that. Right. And I just went for it. Yeah, you know. And I'm sure, you know, like you are, you, you did it, you shut up about it. Was I took a few, then I think I, yeah, I think I said, uh, yeah, Matt Morgan, I think it was, grabbed me for a, a power bomb. And I said, man, I don't know how to do this. Mm. <laughs> he said, just, just jump. Went for it and took it. Yeah. That was it. When do you feel that you, like, became comfortable with it there? How long do you think it took? And do you think it took longer than some? Uh, because man. eventually, I mean, you were, like, the main event dude. You and Jeter were tearing the house down. Right? I mean, eventually, you yeah, guys were the man. Eventually got to that point. I mean, it was it was rough for a while, but it was like, you know, going in, I'm not somebody that throws up a facade of, hey, I just want to fit in. I want to do, you know, I'm going to be mean no matter what it is. And it's like, I'm pretty respectful to most people, you know, unless they're going to cross me with something. But it's like, I think it, did, it didn't take that long. I think when they realized I was at least a genuine dude and I mm-hmm. wasn't there to, you know, step in on people's toes and not be appreciative of what I had, you know, and I think some other people were you know, bitter, you know, and I think they got over that. And it, it took, I don't know, maybe a couple months before it was like, all right, started getting a little respect. You know, certain guys that wouldn't get in the ring with you at first now will get in and start working with you and helping you. Um, what was your first character you wanted to be? Did you have one? Or is it harder because you're a tough enough guy? Yeah, tough enough guy. You're kind of stuck You're just, that. hey, you're the and tough then, enough dude. And then we had, uh, I think... I think he was actually the first. They had John and I as a tag team in OVW with Cornette there, and he goes, "I got the perfect thing." And I think oh, he was, it was, it was uh, Team Tough Enough. That was our first game. That's his brainchild. Yeah, that was that was our first. Since you, I, listen, I've been thinking all day and night about this. I've been going at it. I, I've came up with it. You know, I've, I've been putting my little even Rolodex and flipping it around. Team Tough Enough. That's what I've came up. with. That's it, man. <laughs> wow. So that's how we started. And did you? And oh, I, did you have jerseys and uh, and ring men with you? No, man. <laughs> <laughs> it was big coming just, down the ring with you. Yeah, big, big, big having our back and just you know us wearing the, the most ridiculous ring gear possible because we never had any stuff before. You know, well, who did you get your first ring gear from? Man, I think I bought mine from High Spots. Your High Spots, I think so. Good plug, good plug. Yeah. Well, you you were wearing shorts, right? At, yeah, actually, the first actual match I wrestled on OVW was uh, I think it was a dark match, and uh, yeah, I wore board shorts. And Cornet flipped his lid, told me to burn him like he's over. The- <laughs> Just told me to burn him. Didn't ever want to see it again. I was an embarrassment. You know, this. Not like, hey Matt, can you? Uh, hey man, can you? Uh, you know, wear some some short some trunks or some tights. You know, burn those fuck <laughs> like, right. <laughs> That's like- <laughs> basically what it was. Yeah, exactly. And so high. I love how everyone knows to go right to high spots. Yeah, man. So who uh, who like befriended you? I know Joey's a big friend. Yeah, Your Joey's a big friend. He was kind of later on. Right? He wasn't. Yeah, he wasn't there early on. 
you know, I was tight with John, and uh, you know, pretty much everybody after a while got got to be pretty tight with. You know, it was it wasn't like the outcast anymore. It was kind of like, all right. This this dude's one of us. He's proven his. But obviously, you're a couple steps behind a lot. Some of the guys that had been wrestling on the scene for a while were, were there. Guys willing to, I mean, help you out. Uh, take was there maybe specifically guys that that helped mold your career a little bit. Maybe not so much the trainers because that's what they're paid to do. Right. But guys that were floating around. I don't. I don't remember who was in your class specifically. Man, down there, the guys that that probably helped me the most and were the first to step out was uh, Seven Kevin Thorne. You know, he he stepped out, Doug Basham, Nick Dinsmore, uh, Rob Conway. You know, those guys, after a while, warmed up and were kind of like, hey, man, let's let's help you out a little bit, okay. you know, and that was cool. Um, and then I saw – I did a uh, I did an enhancement match, a heat match, and I think you had done a match. That's why the first time I saw you in a while was, like, uh, in Indianapolis. Did you work the Miz? Did you tag with the Miz? You had a lot of starts and stops, right? A lot of, yeah, man. I did a lot of, you know, house show, live events, and I did some Velocity, some Heat. Some did you do a Velocity? Shows, like, did yeah, you I debut did. on a Velocity? No, it was, no, it was almost like a, I don't even know if it was a, if it was a dark Velocity. <laughs> <It> was, <laughs> didn't quite make Velocity, but it wasn't a dark match. But I it mean. was, all the Velocity stuff was up? You yeah, mean? I guess okay. so, pre-Velocity, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, did, I worked with the tag with the Miz for a while. Was that supposed to be the one? I mean, did they give you a couple, hey, Matt, we're starting you tomorrow, we're starting you next week? No, I didn't get that. The, the one that I did get was, I don't know if I want to get into this later, but was before my, my head injury. You know, I was supposed to be at Raw that following Monday. That so you had gotten a call or they had given you ideas or I was flying well I was flying to uh, Stanford to shoot some vignettes uh, on a Saturday or Friday and uh, that show that I got clocked in the head was Wednesday. Fuck! Did you have sorry? <laughs> and I know you're not a man of swears. I apologize for that. Sorry. Man. Um, did did they know what the vignettes were? They had it all. Pieced out. It was. I think it was. It was going to be set up with uh, the Miz and I. We're going to be uh, kind of like a pseudo reality type duo, something or other. I don't mm -hmm. know. I don't even really know what it was, but they just said. So you you knew out. you were going. You knew you were doing it. Mm -hmm. You were all you were all ready to go. Oh, yeah. And then that Wednesday happens. Man, we'll walk us through that a little bit, huh? Wednesday. It just you know we were. I think it, I'm trying to remember, Max. My my memory's kind of shady with some stuff, but. It was uh, you know Wednesday night OVW TV and it was the the main event which was something was going on oh it was me and Jeter still feuding I had a partner I think it was yeah it was Cage Chris Cage at the time and uh, Mark Henry was with Jeter kind of like his uh, you know his heater his heater he's his monster and uh, at the end of the match the whole swerve was you know we won but Cage turns his back on me, joins Jeter and Mark Henry. So at the end of the match, you know, uh, Cage is supposed to turn around and, and clock me, which he ended up killing me. <laughs> put it, Almost. Put it, yeah. yeah. Put, no, I actually probably <laughs> saved my life, to be honest with you. But he, uh, you know, put an elbow through my jaw and uh, just knocked me out cold. Was it like a, uh, like a forearm or an elbow? It was or? a forearm. Okay. Yeah, a forearm, but he caught me with the elbow right in the chin mm -hmm. or right in the jaw. Knocked me out cold. And the only thing I remember from that point, uh, past that was from the video that I watched, and it was like I was out cold. They're dragging me around in the ring, and I don't think they quite knew I was out. And but I remember watching the video back and taking like some some slams from Mark Henry and some uh, oh God. some stuff going on. And I was like, I don't remember a thing of that until I watched it back. And you could just see I was dead weight being thrown around, and I was like, man, I was lucky. But you know, at that point, it was just like I woke up from that. Walked to the back, felt completely normal. Oh, out of the, out of the blackout. Yeah. Okay. When, when when I was you know came to or whatever, I don't even remember going to the back, but I just remember I'm in the back. I'm sitting there. I'm like, okay, I'm fine. You know, how was the match? You know, blah blah blah, whatever. And then at that point, everybody starts crowding around me, like, man, we need to go get you checked out or something. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I feel completely fine. You know, it's I compare it to to football days, man. I've been hit harder playing football than. You look at that shot, that elbow, and it's like, ah, eh, it wasn't that bad. Right. You know, but it knocked me out clean. And uh, so finally it was like Jeter was like, man, really gotta, I'm going to take you to the hospital. They really, you know, the trainers really want you to go and get checked out. Just, I'm like, finally, end of the night, he convinced me to go, took me, drove me over there, and uh, they just took me to the ER. They wanted to do a, a quick CAT scan. 
and uh, we sat there for a while, did the CAT scan. And the the one thing I remember about that night, man, is I'm sitting in this like you know I almost remember there's like a basement, like a room that had no door, but it was like a cinder block room. Is sitting on this uh, table, almost like looked like on CSI, man. You see a cadaver table. It's just stainless steel, and you're just sitting there. I don't know why I was sitting there, but one doctor came in and said, "All right, we're, you know the, we're working on the results of, of your scan." And then about ten minutes later, uh, I hear like sets of footsteps walking down the hallway towards my room and there's like six doctors <laughs> and my immediate thought is man something's going on because when one doctor shows up and then six come back and it's just like and they just looked at they all crowd around me and just looked at me and said you know we found uh from your skin that you've got a, a mass in your brain it's like well, how do you respond to something like that you know it's like all right, what's well, you know? What are we doing about this? You know, Did you think that was from wrestling? I had no idea, man. Because I said, I said, what, what caused us something like this? And they're like, there's various reasons. We don't know how long you've had it, what caused it. Were you uh, like that goddamn? Oops, sorry. Were you like that GD Chris Cage? Yeah. yeah. I was, <laughs> no, I was, I was thinking, man. I was at the time. It was just like you know, I'm in Louisville by myself. My all my family's back in New York, and it's like. When you get hit with some news like that and you've got nobody around you that, other than, you know, your friends and stuff, mm-hmm. but when you've got family that's gone, it's like, man, people you want to lean on right there. It's right. Like, phew, scary. So, I, I mean, what do you, what do they, do they say go, like, do they explain everything to you right there? Do they? No, do they you, don't know anything. They man. don't know anything. They know, all they know is there's something in my brain that's not supposed to be there. They don't know how it got there, what it is, or you know what needs to happen. And these are six doctors that don't know. Six anything. doctors are just, you know, basically baffled. Number one, that I hadn't had any problems. You know, there, you had any symptoms, any dizziness, any passing out, any seizures, anything like that. And I said, no, I felt felt fine. You know, and uh, no answers. It's like, well, what do I do? And they said, well, we got to get you to a neurosurgeon ASAP. So they set up to get with a neurosurgeon. The neurosurgeon looks at the MRI, says, yeah, you have a a, a brain tumor. We don't know if it's malignant or benign or what. What's the difference with those two? I don't know. Benign is like it's a tumor, but it's not cancerous. Okay. If it's uh, malignant, malignant is cancer. Okay. So, and then within the malignancy stage, there's there's four stages, one through four. Four being terminal, nothing we can do. One being very slow growing, not aggressive. So they had to do an actual biopsy on it to find out what the tissue makeup was. So they had to stick a needle in my head and basically extract as much, a little bit as they could without doing too much damage. And, they, uh, and the thing, man, that, that is crazy, and there's like little tidbits of things that I never will never forget and are ingrained in my brain, <laughs> no pun intended, right. you know, as long as I live. But I was in that doctor's office going in for my results, and the doctor basically tiptoed around everything that he knew I didn't want to hear. But as a doctor, you shouldn't do that. And I remember him saying, yeah, you, you've got a, a brain tumor. We, we got the pathology back, and we're going to say it's, it's a, a stage two. And I said, well, what does, what does that mean exactly? He said, well, we we got to watch it and make sure it doesn't grow any bigger because you're not having enough problems right now. Or you can just go have the surgery now, and you could lose your vision, your hearing, your talking ability, all bodily functions. You might even die. You know, and it's like, well, if I'm feeling relatively okay right now, let's not take those chances right off the bat, you know. And uh, But when I left the office, it's kind of how he left it. And I actually got home and started thinking about it, and I called back and talked to, like, his secretary. And I'm like, look, I I don't know if I'm just not hearing everybody clearly, but I need to know, do, do I have brain cancer? And, the you know, you could tell her voice just dropped because that's not something that she really – her job should be to tell people that but she knew that i was like <sighs> my life was hanging right on this. give it you know, to me what's you know yeah. give it to me straight so i can deal with it and it was kind of like <sighs> she's like well let me just check with the doctor type thing and she's she kind of left it as you know we should come back in and talk to him type thing i said no i need i'd already talked to him but he didn't say anything either way i need to know and is it just you or had your family come in by this point no, my family hadn't been in. This so it's just you. Just me. Man, it's so. And um, then it was like, no, I'm sorry. No, my family wasn't. Okay. My family wasn't. And uh, they they were there for the biopsy, and then they left shortly after just to get everything done at home so they could come back. 
And uh, so finally he got on the phone and was just like, yeah, it's, it's a stage two cancer. It's malignant. You know, and I'm like, okay, I need to know that. You know, lay it on me. Yeah. And uh, and that's hard to take. Well, I can only imagine. I don't know. Well, then it gets worse, man, because the same neurosurgeon that did the biopsy and told me that it was a, a malignant tumor I said, what are what are my options from this point? He said, well, you know, you can watch it because it's, we don't think it's super aggressive, but it's still cancer. And he and I said, okay, so if I wanted to have the surgery, what's involved with that? And he goes, well, I'm not comfortable doing that surgery. He does, this guy doesn't seem like the best doctor well, from I, from this little conversation. Right yeah, here. you would think, yeah. but when you got a you know supposedly a good neurosurgeon looking at you, telling you he's not going to touch this thing, it, you know what I mean? It makes you think, all right, well, what do I do now? You know, right. Can you refer me to somebody yeah. that'll, that'll do something? And he's kind of like, well, I can give you, you gave me some names and numbers and all this and that. And it was just like a big mess of like, this is the last thing I want to worry about is who's going to cut my head open. Yeah. You know, and he's, just, he's saying it's, do you think, cause I'm thinking he's saying it's too bad. I don't want to be the guy that fucks this up, screws this up. Basically, <laughs> basically he was like, he doesn't trust himself enough or it's such a delicate thing that there's so many things that could go wrong. He doesn't want to be responsible for something that goes wrong. So it's like, all right, now back to the drawing board. I know I got this serious problem, but what do we do about it? Yeah. And it ultimately came down to, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to get an MRI every three months. I'm not going to have the surgery till I can find a surgeon that is capable. <laughs> you know what I mean? It doesn't have a, you know, operation set that he does for fun. And, and were you doing anything to stall it? Is that where chemo and stuff comes in or? No, this was, at this point, it was monitored. We monitored it every three months with an MRI. So during this time, I wasn't doing anything other than just taking it easy. And uh, at this point, every three months, tumor stayed basically stable. So no changes whatsoever. They kept saying, you may never have to have surgery. This may be completely fine. You may have had this your whole life. We don't know. And uh, you might have just found it by chance, and now it's there. But mm-hmm. not going to do anything. We went a year and a half of three month or monthly or every three-month MRIs. So a year and a half, every three months MRIs, nothing happened. No problems whatsoever. Then in a matter of two months... From December to February, I went back and got my last latest MRI, and it had somehow tripled in size out of <sighs> out of nowhere. Ooh, and does I, it still stay a stage two, or is it now? Yeah, it stayed as an aggressive stage two, almost but it's bigger. Yeah, two, just, two A. Yeah, right, basically. And uh, it was at that point, I was like, we got to do something, okay? You know, because I started having severe headaches and stuff like that. And I was do like, you, All right. you don't? I, this is stupid to ask, but like, do you feel like? Is the headaches like pushing? Is it coming? Do you feel like the pressure, dude? It was, the actual pressure of the tumor? Or? No, it's it's. I can't even describe it because I've never had like a migraine, so I don't know how to compare it to a migraine. But uh, it was just the most intense pain I've ever felt in my life, and it was just from a direct point. No, all just over, all over, just all over the head, my eyes, my head, my face, everything was just like on fire and just excruciating. Mm. So what's the move? I mean, is this? It's, is this when we slice open, or is this? This is when I had already, I already, I already found a surgeon, and I was just kind of waiting to see if I was going to have to use them or not. I was, you know, obviously trying to get away with not doing this strategic, you know, surgery mm-hmm. and, and not losing any of my senses, apparently. And uh, it was at that time that the surgeon that I found was at the, this place called the Leahy Clinic in uh, Boston, just outside Boston, Massachusetts, and I. Uh, Basically called up, they read my the results of my latest MRI and said, "Yeah, we got to get you in." So, got the plane ticket, flew out there. My family, you know, wasn't that bad of a drive for my family. Met all out there, had the surgery, you know, and, and they there's a piece of that that tumor that was near my brainstem, which controls all your functions mm-hmm. in the body, basically your breathing, your everything, your heart rate. And he couldn't touch that. He got as close to that as he could, but he had to leave a little bit of it because it was too dangerous to make that cut. So he left it, and that's why I had to do. I had to finish with the radiation treatments. I did 30 radiation treatments right after surgery for 30 days, and then I did. I started my chemotherapy, which I did for two years consecutively, and finished it in '09. Oh, Is that was that Doctor the Man? I mean, what's oh, dude? Yeah, what's his name? The Man. The man, it was Dr. Cosgrove at the Leahy Clinic. 
in uh, Burlington, Mass. You got any brain tumors, man? <laughs> yeah, you, go you see go, him go see for your, guy your brain tumor needs. He did. <laughs> He's accessible at any time, man. Uh, but this guy, man, I, I got to show you the, the MRI picture of, of post-surgery, of how close his cut was to my brain stem, of, like, how meticulous that had to be mm -hmm. to be a success. And the only thing that I suffered from the surgery uh, was I lost some vision. Like, my peripheral vision above my head, I can't see, so, you know, you see me mowing my lawn, and I hit my head on a branch. <laughs> you know, stuff like that happens, and it's like, I, I didn't see that there. Just like imagine what they did in the 20s, you know? Uh, it's almost like how fortunate that we're in this age, and just imagine, you know, 20, 30 years from now, 40 years from now. It's it's crazy. But man. he went in the, this meticulous slice, and, you know, it's just 100 years ago, that's not no happening. Hope, nah, yeah. No hope, man. Yeah. And I get people all the time that, that know my story or hear of my story and tell me that they had somebody in their family, friend that had a brain tumor, brain cancer, whatever it might be, and it was 20 years ago. And at that time, it was just that. They're Even, like, they we're very limited on what we can do. And they either, you know, passed away or they're severely disabled, which could have been the case for me, too. And are you, are you cancer free now or? Yeah. Just 100% cancer free? Yeah, I, uh, I go back. Actually, in two weeks for my nine-month MRI. And then after this one, if this one's clean, a uh, clean bill of health, man, it'll move to every 12 months. So once a year, I'll just get checked. And, I mean, you, your support system must have been crazy. Uh, your family, you have a wife. Yeah. Uh, was there, I mean, I'm sure you guys talk about that. She, she was, was she with you by the side? I mean, Dude. she's got to be... <laughs> Amazing to you, you, listen to this, man. I tell you what kind of a, a girl she is. I was when I was diagnosed. It was uh, beginning of '06, probably January when I got that result with that, from that doctor that didn't want to do the surgery and told me what it was. Um, I proposed to my wife in February, and I told her, I said, "Look, I will not be upset if you walk away from this if this is too much for you to handle right now i said you know what i mean it's like i can't blame you for for just being overwhelmed she you know she was gosh probably 20 at the time so she's a young girl you know i'm 24 at the time and it was like you can walk away from this and I, no hard feelings whatsoever but you know i love you let's do this so we uh eloped and flew to hawaii got married in march and that was it nice and she you know she stuck by me man. yeah yeah a lot of a lot of other people wouldn't yeah, how long have you guys been together now? Be six years this March. Awesome, and you I mean, and it's this is a great story. Like it's just a, a triumph story. Yeah, it, it is, man. And you know, it's, it's there's been a lot of ups and downs through this. Like everybody has their own, mm -hmm. but you know, this is my story. Yeah, you were, and you did. Have you gone? Did, did you find like what? I mean, I know uh, um, religiously you found yourself a lot, but like, have, have you? I'd love to know just what comes. I mean, what comes out of, just what comes out of all of it. Like, that's different from before, or what an experience like this makes you as a man or as a person. Yeah, man. I think you know I was rooted in my faith before this happened. You know, and it was kind of like that was a lot of what got me through and, and kept me focused on knowing that this, regardless of how crazy I think it is and how I can fathom it in my own brain it's it's like this is part of god's plan somehow and through everything that i've done like if i look back at football wrestling everything that i've been able to do uh i've made more of an impact in people's lives and done more positive things post this happening and it's like i've been able to use this story and what's happened to me to like help a lot of people like i've you know spoken to different organizations churches schools children adults whoever it might be and it's just like man it's it's been used to uh, reach a whole different audience that I never would have been able to get to. And I guess to full circle, the is the pa the passion for professional wrestling. Um, I mean, obviously, like you said, professional wrestling saved your life, right? Yeah. I mean, you in a wrestling ring getting knocked out took you there and found this thing. Uh, do you still watch every every week, or do you do you follow the guys? Do you? I, I follow the guys, you know. And I'll be honest, man. There was a, a point where I was so torn up, man, that this passion of mine was taken away from me. I couldn't go around it. I couldn't watch it. Not because I didn't want to, but just because physically and emotionally, I still I still had it in me. You know what I mean? But 
when you, you get something pulled away from you that you love so much and, you know what I mean, it's, it's part of you and you can't do it, it's like, man, it was like torture. Going, going in, to the OVW going shows. Going to the yeah. arena, just being in that atmosphere, but it's almost like, you know, you, you got handcuffs on and it's you're chained up and you can't do anything. And it wasn't until recently that I'm able to go back and just be there and enjoy it like a fan that I am. Or, you know, a former performer, you know what I mean? That it's like I can still be around now and not have those feelings. So it's like I'm, I'm gradually getting away from that. And it's got to be nice to, like, to have OVW here in Louisville or where you're living. Just if you need that fix, it's so close. Like, is, if you are, you know, stuff has been taken away from a lot of people. But, you know, you can always, obviously... You know the wrestling isn't there, but you look jacked, man. You're you're back in the gym, like. Well, I've been in the gym, man. I I think I only, you know, during my chemotherapy and everything, it was like I s- made myself go to the gym. You know, obviously not doing what I normally. Are would. you supposed to do that? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Probably not. But it, it it wasn't a there wasn't a, a choice in my mind. It was it was same thing with wrestling. It was like. I've had stuff pulled away from me, but I am still able to do this. I'm not letting this get pulled away from me. So I stayed in the gym, man, kept working as hard as I could. Did you ever feel physically – it seems like a lot of it – like a lot – it just seems like they told you stuff and you're like, oh, I have that. But you, you – like you said, like, well, I'm not hurting. Did you? Was there a point in your time where you felt like shriveled and, and unable physically? Well, the, probably the, the thing that <sighs> – first set the reality in of what i was going through was when i was during my radiation treatments and uh basically you know my hair started falling out and it was kind of thing where it didn't start falling out where you started noticing it one day after one of my treatments i had like a my side of my head was itching so i'm just scratching the side of my head and uh i put my hand down and my hand is covered in hair it's like a movie in it yeah, yeah that's I'm not like, supposed to happen to you i'm like what and then I just to check to see, I, I like pinched a piece of my hair and it pulled out like it wasn't even attached to anything. And I'm just like, whoa, this is like the stuff you hear about. Right. And, you know, uh, another short story, man, when I was up there during that radiation, my hair started falling out. Um, I, I shaved it into a mohawk because it was the only hair I had left that looked halfway decent. Right. But it was the worst mohawk you've ever seen <laughs> because it was like all thin and like I had like chemo brain and, and radiation head and you know all that, that <laughs> stuff. But it was the worst thing ever. But in my mind, it was like everything. So many things have been taken away. And I went to talk. This people asked me to talk to uh, a high school football team. So I went in, and in the minute I walked in, you could hear dude, these you know, these kids making comments that look at the dude's mohawk. Mm. You know, what an idiot. You know, right. Like, You're trying good. to hold on to your badass. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. With that half-ass falling out mohawk. Right. So I'm, like, biting my tongue the whole way up there, and I'm like, you know, and I just told my story, and I said, you know, you guys can say what you want, but you know what? You know, I hear, I hear things as I walk in. <laughs> and I said, you know, this this hair on my head, I said, cancer's taken a lot from me. And I said, I'm not giving things up. I said, if cancer wants this, the rest of this hair, it's got to take it. You know, that kind of thing. And it shut them right up. Well, I'm sure. So, you know, think about what people's situations are, man. You don't know. Don't judge people just by what the appearance is, man, because you don't know somebody's story. Yeah. I think it resonated with the kids, man. But yeah. it's like stuff like that, man. It's It's been awesome to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. Great, man. Um so now, I mean, this you know, are you not you're not plugging anything? I don't know. Like, you want to plug <laughs> with uh, Doctor Corngrove? What was his name again? Doctor Cor- Doctor Cornrow. Yeah. No, <laughs> Doctor Cosgrove. Doctor Cosgrove. Leahy Clinic. Go hang out with him. Go hang out with him for all your brain tumors. Does, does Faith Inc. still run around? No, man. I, I did that for a while, and it was just it was too much for me to keep up. It was just me. Yeah. In the house. Just. Yeah, I know. I know it well. Wearing off get- shirts and doing what I could to. to you know, keep something positive going, and it was just time, time to cut it off. Mm-hmm. But. Well, I guess what well, I mean, we should say, you want to? Do you tell people to? What should they learn more? I mean, you know, what's the where's the sources to go to you, to learn more about cancer? To, to make sure you check yourself? Is it like check yourself, man? Don't <laughs> don't wreck yourself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh man, don't don't ignore. You know, the, the the signs, man. I always talk about preventative maintenance now. Okay. You know, just like with your vehicle, dude, you got to do it to your body. You know something's going wrong, just get checkups. Because you, you find stuff early enough, they can do something about it. There's so much medical advancement going on, they can deal with pretty much anything. But you get too late, man, you're, you're out of luck. And fortunately, 
I found mine early enough. Yeah. Well, you should see the inside of my car What's right it? now. It's probably the same as the inside of my body. <laughs> Just a mess. <laughs> Just a mess. Just a real mess. Well, we'll go see Dr. Cosgrove. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is that a metaphor? Man.